ask all of our speakers if they'd come up here and take a seat, and, uh, and we're going to have about uh, 15 minutes or so to take some questions from uh, those of you in the, uh, in the audience. You can address it just generically, and I'll ask for members of our speaking crew today to uh, volunteer to respond, or if there's somebody in particular that you want to direct your question to, you, you are free and welcome to say so. So do we have some, uh, we got some questions out there? I have to guard my eyes a little bit. This uh, young lady in the back in the red. Okay, my name is Liz Evans, oh, and I actually live in North Denver um, on the west side of I-25, so this issue is very important to me. I understand that a lot of the issues involved with putting um, I-70 where it is now were political, and I understand that a lot of the issues with getting I-70 out of North Denver will be political, and I'm wondering if any of you can address how we can influence uh, the processes more effectively, because we've been, we've been working on this for quite a while, and, and any kind of guidance you have would be very helpful on how to influence the political process. John, I think you're the most qualified to talk about <laughs> the political process. Uh, I, I guess the one advice I'd have for you uh, is that it's really important to take like the vision thing that uh, the vision that Dean Foreman showed at the end. You need to show people what you're fighting over, the good things, and then show pictures of the bad things that the other stuff is involved in. And then, uh, like Cynthia, is that right? Uh, you know, you, you start talking about the price in Milwaukee, the Park East. To rebuild it, its design life was nearing its end, would have cost two and a half times as much as tearing it down and putting it in the boulevard. So you get into those kinds of arguments, and you just try to win every argument you can. But visually, you should win. If you have visual preference comparisons, what uh, your, your coalition wants to do is more beautiful and more valuable, and it's cheaper, and, you know, everywhere you do it. So you just have to keep making that argument as prominent as you can and find a couple of politicians that will agree with you and give them courage and strength and support and then challenge the ones that aren't with you and then always make room for them to become part of the coalition without you know, reminding them how stupid they were before. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, other questions out there? I'm sure there have got to be some. This young lady, go ahead. My question is, I am a resident of Globeville, and I am concerned that with this project, if the property values go up, then the taxes eventually will go up. As you know, we are a low-income community, so my concern is that the people that decide to stay there and live with the houses at a higher value, they won't be able to afford and pay the yearly taxes on that inflation. The value of the houses have gone, gone down in the past two years, but the rent is still very high. There are houses there that are at least $1,000 to rent per month, and that's what really worries me about what's going to happen with the I-70 project. First off, I've, I've heard this discussion a lot, the concern about will increased property values drive additional taxes? and will that then effectively drive people out of the neighborhood? And while I'm not going to pretend to be an expert about this, I think I've heard a lot of very thoughtful responses and I hope that I can repeat it here. And I'm gonna go back to one of the illustrations, one of the three that I used in my presentation, and it was referencing, or using as an example, 4335 Thompson Court, which is in the Swansea neighborhood. And that house currently today is worth approximately $140,000. Comparable houses, the same distance from downtown, roughly the same size, r built roughly at the same time, are worth 3.25 and 4.14 times as much money. So let's just say for purposes of illustration here that 4335 Thompson Court did double in value. That means that that homeowner has $140,000 of additional equity and $140,000 of additional net worth. So with such a change, 
the tax bill probably would go up in the range of $500 or $600 a year, but with that additional $140,000 equity, that homeowner should be able to go out and get a reverse mortgage, which would actually pay them monthly and would never require a payment. And or let's say that they would tap a very small portion of that equity. Let's just say for the purposes of illustration, they went out and got a $10,000 home equity line of credit on that $140,000 increase. They could pay that tax bill, that increased tax bill, for 20 years on that $10,000 home equity line of credit. So I think that we probably want to look at this from a slightly different perspective to say, what is the opportunity cost of not having that appreciation? The opportunity cost is that people don't have the equity in their homes for perceived safety and security for their retirement years. They can't use that equity to send their kids to college. They can't use that equity to be the springboard from a new business that they want to start. There are so many better opportunities with $140,000 of additional appreciation versus a four or $500 additional annual tax bill. There are some programs in other cities of which I am not familiar with any great amount of detail that can be tax benefits both for seniors and both for people who are fitting into various usually socioeconomic situations. And that may well be something that we need to address specifically with elected officials here in Denver as it relates to this. But this is not a new problem. These are the same problems that people have in lots of other parts of central Denver and have had for a very long time. And the reality is it's much more of an opportunity than it is a burden. I'm now going to try to address the second part of the discussion as it relates to rents. In the past three years, the statistics in the city and county of Denver is that rents have increased between 8 and 10 percent each year. That is not a problem that is unique to Globeville, Illyria, or Swansea. And it is a problem that we need to be working on for people in our entire city, in the metro area. And I think that that probably doesn't have a specific solution, nor benefit, nor problem as it relates to this proposed expansion or conversion to a boulevard. Maria, does that help? Yeah. That's very, yes. very good, Steve. Yes, thank you. Good Thanks, Maria. Good to have you. Recognize that uh, Armando is going to make a comment on this as well. First of all, I'd like to thank you for that question. And uh, I think Steve Moss is still in the audience, and, and Chris uh, Guzman, I believe, is still here. And one of the things that uh, Chris Guzman and myself we're going to be doing is reaching out to the community, and I believe uh, June, I'm not sure of the date, but Chris, if you could please stand up. Chris is the Vice President of Community Banks of Colorado, and what we're going to be doing is doing a finance class for the community, uh, doing out through, uh, throughout the month of June, and we're going to be reaching out and have the community members bring in their financial statements. And one good statement would be, uh, to bring in would be your taxes. We can help with the OPO process, look at some alternative ways to help keep those taxes down. I know there's a tax reduction in terms of your senior citizen. We can look at some alternative ways. So yes, we are, from a community standpoint, trying to reach out to the community and trying to help the residents of, uh, of Elyria, Global and Swansea. And there's people like Chris that are out there that are uh, reaching out and trying to uh, provide some quality service to the, to the residents. So that's one aspect. One other thing that we could do, um, will this work? I don't know. Reach out to the homeowners. Uh, the owners of the properties and say, hey, if they can keep, uh, keep those uh, properties down, we can try and ensure some quality uh, control in terms of working with Habitat for Humanity, working for Owens Corning, trying to keep the maintenance of those properties down so it's less cost on the owner and then keep the cost and the rents down. But that's something we need to do collectively as a, as a community. So again, we, you know, we are trying to reach out and uh, trying to address those issues. So thank you. Thanks very much, Amanda. Clearly, that's a, a legitimate problem, but um, uh, the problem of your values going up is a lot better than the problem of your values going down. Uh, do we have other questions out there? We do. This young lady? Yes. And we'll take um, one more after her, because uh, then we're coming up on time. I have Go two ahead. 
relatively quick ones. That's fine. One was actually something that Jane mentioned earlier about um, opportunities for intervention with this whole process. And she mentioned, which was something I thought about before, the Army Corps of Engineers, about getting them involved to do you know, some investigation on this too. But I was told that their role was kind of limited and that maybe this wouldn't be something they were interested in. So if anybody knows about that, um, because I think that would be a worthwhile thing to do, to get some of these other experts involved. Well, with the Army Corps, they, they're focused on waterways, streams, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that tends to be their involvement in the, in the water kind of issues. But uh, there are a lot of people that would be able to weigh in from different perspectives on the, on the trench and, and the uh, water issue. Uh, you know, the EPA definitely needs to look at that. Yeah, there's huge water issues between that and also the, the stock show. But Jane, if you okay. could comment on that too. If my mic is on, I guess it is. Yeah, I mentioned those two because I thought of them. They're both um, cooperating agencies with the EIS, so they're fully, they're engaged in the EIS process. Um, the thing about the Corps is that they also have to issue permits after the EIS, so they'll have continue to have an interest in the mitigation and what, what all happens. So I would think that their you know, level of awareness is pretty high and would stay that way. The EPA has to actually rate the EIS uh, as if it's acceptable or not acceptable. So they're, they're engaged right now with the EIS and they went on a tour. So those two came to mind as um, two of several that have to either issue permits or are some way involved. How you get their attention, you know, I think taking the EPA on the tour was, was a really good way to, to get that started. Um, to stay involved with the Corps and ask the questions, how is this you know, drainage thing really going to work, could continue to do that as well. And then the other one that I wanted to, and I think you, you spoke to this, um, John, about a lot of our concentration has been on the reroute. Instead of just saying, well, let's just turn this into a boulevard, and, and that would be the solution. Because part of the problem that we're getting about telling people about the reroute is that um, we're hearing Adams County under no way wants to have that. And so they say that just, you know, makes it impossible to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, it's logical to try to respond to the, the DOT saying, well, then what are we supposed to do with the traffic? If, you, if you're stopping the road and just, it's irresponsible for you not to have some solution. Uh, no, actually, because as Peter pointed out, uh, they're overestimating the need for an additional road. They're also already planning on adding to the width of that road to the north anyway. Uh, and I don't think, it, you know, it, everybody here is responsible. People like Dean Foreman, when we were talking about this before, I mean, he's, he's trying to be responsible, fair-minded, all that sort of thing. So you respond to that by saying, well, then the traffic could go up here. But if you live up here, Adams County, Thanks a lot. You just told us how rotten it is for you. Now you want to give it to us, you know. So it, that that argument that doesn't uh, doesn't really work very well. And I I think it's better for you to just point out that the that the trap his his ten percent argument is great, and the ninety percent that's using the road a lot of that doesn't need to use the road's gone, then the then the traffic randomly goes through the other arterials, goes down Broadway or goes down whatever other streets, goes to the downtown some other way. It, it disappears. And it, I would do that and not try to do traffic analysis for people that live far away from you who won't appreciate it. And we've seen that, like in Louisville, trying to stop this huge interchange in downtown Louisville, which has already got too much road anyway. And the, the anti-freeway people said, well, put it out there in the horse country. You know, put another road out there, and that'll solve the problem. Well, the problem is the people who live in the horse country, they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of power. And they call up the governor, and the governor answers the phone personally. I mean, they, and, and they hired one of us. We, Norm Marshall is one of the great traffic analysts in the world. 
and uh, he's a, he has a master's degree in math. They hired him, and, uh, and he ran rings around the people. You know, too bad for Norm. We've got to beat him up for that. But, uh, <laughs> but you, you're really, you know, shifting the problem to somebody else, you're not going to win it. You didn't create the problem. They did. The, when the highway department 35, 40 years ago decided to put that fire hose of traffic running straight into, into uh, Denver, that was a mistake. They didn't realize it probably, but it was a mistake. They did it. And they, it's not your responsibility to solve the problem they created, but you can solve the problem in your own neighborhood by saying, this boulevard will work. It'll, it'll absorb a lot of traffic. The, the problem will diminish. All they have to do is look at all the other places where it's happened. They said there would be traffic Armageddon in Los Angeles. They shut down the Century Freeway for, what was it, a week? Yeah, no. And nothing, no problem. Yeah. They don't need that freeway. They should just close the damn thing. <laughs> Uh, Steve, you wanted to make a comment on the first question about the uh, politics. I do, just really quickly back to the first question about politics. The Unite North Metro Denver group, which is comprised of about 30 or 40 or 50 individuals who have been discussing this information for quite a long time, is sponsoring a speaker who is coming to Denver, nationally recognized person about how to make a public comment. So now I'm plugging this. It's a free event. I believe that it's on May 4th and May 5th. There are flyers out in the lobby for it. And that information is also on the website, www.unitenorthmetrodenver.com. And there are flyers for that out there as well. From that Unite North Metro Denver website, you can go in there and unless you unselect somebody on the list, your comment that you put in there will be sent to four people at CDOT and about 10 local elected officials. So that's a start in having your voices heard. I, I, would, I would also offer another, uh, uh, I'll call this the signage solution. It was uh, done in Washington, DC. If you can envision, you had I-95 coming south to north, came into and was intended to go through Washington, DC, and it was built partially, and there was a huge uproar about the very thing we're talking about here, dividing neighborhoods, costs, and so on and so forth. There's also a, circumfer a, a circumventing roadway called 495 that was already in place. So they solved the problem by just changing the signs. When 95 hits 495, it's not 495 anymore. Now it's 95 on the eastern half where it re reconnects with the former 95. And it was just a change of signs. Solved the problem, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, we had, uh, I think, one more question from this gentleman, and then we're going to wrap it up. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, we've been told that uh, when these projects happen, it increases the value in the, uh, the property values and things like that, giving opportunities for business, um, and that the traffic takes care of itself. My question is, is what's going to be, uh, what are the likelihoods of what's going to happen to the community that exists there now? We were told straight off that the uh, community is uh, not well educated and they're kind of poor and if you get a, a bunch of aggressive business people coming in here and developing their opportunities when this uh, opportunity, opportunity comes for them, uh, what's going to happen to the neighborhood? We've been told property values are going to go up for houses, but people living in the neighborhood won't realize those property values unless they borrow against it, which means a bank's making money, or they sell and move out. Um, so how does the neighborhood that exists there uh, get protected in the process? Or there's the other issue is that there's a lot of new um, uh, businesses going on in North Denver involved with uh, restaurants and uh, a lot of clubs and that kind of stuff. The possibility of that development might be saturated, so other ideas of uh, developing other kinds of businesses or even you know smaller scale manufacturing. Can anybody speak to those kinds of things of what's going to happen into the community after the uh, boulevard goes in? Okay. I, I just wanna... John, go ahead. Amanda, I'm going to ask you to come up and comment on this too. John, you go ahead. I don't know if this is. I guess. Just grab it. Just grab it. Uh, there's a study that was done by. Uh, professor at uh, Columbia, what's his name? You know, you know who I mean. Anyway, he, uh, he found, he did studies all over, in the big markets all over the country, uh, 
the different metro areas and found that the people, the existing low-income people in a neighborhood were much more likely to adhere to the neighborhood and be in the neighborhood two years, five years later if the neighborhood was improving in value and much more likely to be gone. Now, why is that? Because if you're a poor person and you're in a neighborhood that you think is really crappy and it's getting worse, you're like anybody else. You want to try to figure out how to get out of there. But if you think the neighborhood is getting better, then you try to stay and you find ways to do it. There's also more opportunity for a job in a neighborhood that's improving as opposed to one that's going down. This gentrification issue, I, when I was mayor, you know, it's not a completely Ill illegitimate issue by any means. And in places like New York City and San Francisco, it's definitely, you know, like if you're a working class family in the Mission District in San Francisco and you're watching all these billionaires from Santa Clara County come in and, and buy up the property. But that's not the case in most places. And in Milwaukee, I had acorn plant. I'm not against acorn for the reasons that most that uh, Fox News is. But uh, but a the acorn guy, somebody tried to build a nice building in the African American community, and he would show up and say gentrification, gentrification. He'd always have his hand out. You know, you could give money to our group, and then that'll solve the problem. Uh, but I ended up fighting those people and telling them go away. We need development in the inner city. We need. You've got to have new buildings, not just crumbling old buildings that are falling apart. And if keeping a neighborhood crappy is the only way to hold prices down for people, yeah. that's not a good solution. Yeah. And it's not acceptable. So, and there are ways to have affordable housing. You need more housing. When you have rents going up, that means there's a market for developers to create rental housing. And if this neighborhood improves, there will be more housing. And some of that housing can be rental housing, some of it can be affordable. There are a lot of tools the city can use to incorporate affordable housing in the neighborhood. I think the gentrification argument, the, the worst case for me, there's some guy from Whitefish Bay, which is an almost all white community, remember Greg Squires? And he, was, he knew, he had so much moral concern for the poor in Milwaukee, he was a white guy. He, had, he cared more about poor people than Mother Teresa. But he lived in, in Whitefish Bay with just white people. I said, why do you live out there if you care so much about the poor? Why don't you live in the city? He said, well, my kids have to go to school. What an attitude. Yeah. He was against school choice, too, you know, because he, he wanted to, his choice was to leave town. But, you know, I wouldn't fall for the gentrification argument. The rent thing, that's a serious issue. But I wouldn't let that be the th defining thing about this neighborhood. I don't know, is Armando still here? Yeah, I mean, you want the neighborhood to get better, and you, when it gets better, you want a piece of it. Good question. I, I've, I've uh, been in the real estate business for 20 years, and I've sold real estate all over the state of Colorado. I even did some stuff in uh, Africa, Ethiopia, with uh, a client that I had regarding uh, some stuff, and the ambassador got involved. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But coming back, I totally agree with uh, John over here. You know, gentrification is not going to happen. We have the Purina Dog Show. The mayor, the governor, they talk about Brighton Boulevard being the entrance, the gateway to downtown Denver. Where in, in the world do you come down, a dog manufacturing company, get that odor into a gateway? That's not the most pleasant thing. In my mind, the gateway is Colorado Boulevard. You go down... Uh, Go down Colorado Boulevard, you go by the museum, you go by the zoo, that is a gateway. You present a nice, pleasant picture. But coming back to your point about uh, real estate values going up and gentrification, I don't see that happening because of the fact that the city doesn't care about this neighborhood. It's been neglected. If anything, it'll be marginal increases in property values. It's not going to happen overnight. And as it hasn't happened. We just recently seen some uh, prices go up, and that's only because of the inventory. And I still think HUD has a lot of uh, foreclosure property they've been holding back and the other lending institutions that have been holding back and they don't want to release all these other properties that have been in foreclosure for the past four or five years because they want to let the prices come up. And the, as it, and the only reason the prices come up is because of the lack of inventory. But our neighborhood, Globeville area and Swansea, these are marginal homes. They're distressed. They need a lot of work. They're not going to increase overnight. I don't see that happening. But that, again, that's just my opinion. 
And I agree with John in terms of, uh, I, I just don't see that, foresee that happening. I could be wrong, but hopefully I'm not. I have own five properties in, in Globeville, Lyria, Swansea, and I'm not leaving. People ask me, well, why don't you go live somewhere else? Hey, I like my neighborhood. Why can't we have a better quality of life? Why do I have to leave? I don't have to leave. Bono, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the program. We're uh, close to on time, just a little bit late. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for being responsible citizens. And uh, please give a round of applause for all our speakers. Thank you.